Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning for those that are in Brazil and good morning for those that are in Sweden. I'm Alessandra Omo, Managing Director of CISB. Uh, I think this, it's time to start the, work, the first workshop, Sweden-Brazil workshop, AI and Autonomy Collaboration. It's a pleasure to have all of you here with us today. This workshop is organized by CISB in partnership with CNPQ, and Saab, Linshok University, and Ericsson. Okay, um, next please. So, it's good to start with general guidelines for the workshop. We have a very tight agenda today, okay? Please, keep your microphones off during the presentation, okay? Send your questions in the chat, okay? Speakers will answer then during the event, or if they have time, time after the presentation, uh, I can make the question to the presenter. Okay. At the end, we will have an open discussion. Hope to have several questions. It's our momentum for interaction with the presenters and with the participants. Okay. And I will handle this open session. Okay. And important information. All of the presentations will be sent out to the participants by email later on. Don't worry, okay? We are here to support you. So, uh, I would like right now to ask some welcome words from Vinova, Regina Summer, the funny agent in Sweden. Please, Regina, say some words to the participants and present. Yes, uh, thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Alessandra. This is super interesting and uh, amazing that you gathered all this group of, of, of uh, people. Very important for uh, a potential AI collaboration. So as you know, um, Vinova has worked with uh, you know, building up a, a platform for the collaboration that we call Sweden Brazil Innovation Initiative. And, and this platform has five prioritized areas. Smart cities, bioeconomy, mining, health and aeronautic, of course. And AI, as you, uh, of all people know, is in er everything uh, and in all of these areas, uh, uh, of course. So, uh, therefore, it's very interesting to, to see how, you know, how can we collaborate? What, what is going on and how can we synchronize uh, potential relevant activities? So, I, I really look forward today to, to hearing more from both sides and, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll see. What happens next? Very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for nice words, Regina. You are more than welcome and hope that you can stay all the time with us. OK, so now it's time to ask for our first presenter to make your presentation. Please, Magnus Austrum from Saab, the floor is yours. That means this screen. Thank you. I guess Letizia starts sharing the slides. My name is Magnus Ahlström. I work for Saab, uh, the defense and security company. Uh, we were uh, had the chance to sell some aircraft to Brazil some six years ago, the Gripen fighter system. And that means that we have a long-term collaboration, both, let's say, technology transfer and training, Embraer and other companies but also collaboration in aeronautics and different R&T fields and so on. Part of the contract and part outside the contract, which is the things we are doing now are things we do because we feel that Brazil is a good partner to us. But uh, <clears throat> this was more, the intention is to speak more general. And, and next, please. What about Sweden? We, in many rankings, Sweden is seen as a top nation for innovation. Uh, Partly due to that we have, let's say, a collective collaborative scene and of, of uh, players in, in the country and, and that we invest a lot in R&D. But uh, we also, that is also due to th there is big investments from the, from the government, but also that we have a world-class startup scene with many, many startup companies, especially in business to consumer. Uh, field and digitalization, etc. We often seen a second after Stockholm is seen a second after Silicon Valley in, in terms numbers of unicorns, billion dollar uh, exits of big comp of startup companies. Next, please. And next, please. 
to a large extent, this is this is based on that we have a, a, a huge amount of global companies with origin in Sweden. Many of them are 100 years old, such as Ericsson, we'll hear here soon. But ABB, Scania, uh, SKF, uh, and many others are very well known in the world since a long time. And, and they are part of this sort of innovation system in Sweden, which is a strong collaboration between government, academia, and, and so on. And maybe that's the strength, strong strength of Swedish academia is the, the proximity to the to the to the government and to to the end user, the society, and to the industry. Uh, and and uh, also a big part of the investments in R and D in Sweden is is maybe it's, is based in the companies, maybe two thirds, something like that. So industry key partner, but we are dependent on the collaboration with academia. And we're also depending on the collaboration between ourselves. Next, please. And just a few words about Saab. We are, for a global company, we're, we're not really global. We're mainly like a Swedish company with some uh, smaller, smaller parts in Brazil, US, UK, South Africa, Australia, and elsewhere. We have about 23 billion reais turnover, 12,000 employees, something. Um, we mainly produce like fighter aircrafts, submarines, radar systems, command and control systems, but also to some extent traffic management systems, space applications, etc. Uh, we also do things for mining and other areas where we transfer, let's say, the knowledge of based in defense and security into other fields. We spend a lot of money on 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 the innovation. Some twenty three percent of the turnover we reinvest in development and research and as i mentioned since since 2014 we are building up our our relationship and our activities in brazil we have mainly we have roughly some 100 200 people employed in brazil but we also collaborate strongly with embraer with regarding the grip and system um, our thinking is very much based on that we we collaborate with other companies universities and we do things in open innovation Next, please. One, some, one of our friends uh, in, in this is Ericsson, 10 times larger than Saab, very well known in telecom industry. I'm sure you know about them. They have their research organization, some 700 researchers, and, and they are in, in Brazil since 100 years, roughly, and they have research activities in Brazil. And, and uh, we collaborate a lot in Sweden, but also in other countries in different ways. Next, please. Uh, as, as Regina mentioned before, we weren't sure that she could, she could join until just recently. So I, I made this picture, practically it's Regina's picture. <laughs> but <coughs> Vinova has formed from the, from the government together with the industry and academia, like let's say a platform, a way of collaborating Triple Helix, all the players, active innovation players with different countries and try to organize that towards different countries. And there's a number of countries involved, but Brazil is one of the strongest and the earliest ones. And next, please. Next, uh, yeah, and, and the ambition of that is to, to connect the innovation system of different countries. So even Sweden is a very small country with very small resources, our corporates are globally dispersed and we have global supply chain. And we like to connect, interconnect the innovation systems of different countries with ourselves. And, and so, because we see synergies of that and, and that's the ambition of this initiative. Next, please. And with Brazil, as Regina mentioned, there, there is an ongoing partnerships and since some 10 years or so, very active. We have innovation weeks, we have different uh, workshops on aeronautics, or we have mobility scheme with a CISP is running of, of guest researchers, we come back to that, and so on. And CISP is a very important player in that to be, uh, let's say, a, a, a organization with one foot in Sweden, one in Brazil, but can interlink ourselves between the innovation systems. And, and it's this collaboration around mainly aeronautics, but also in all the other fields that we want to grow into the AI autonomy area, which is applicable to all these areas. 
and and it's a key technology. And and uh, for us as as a aeronautics company, I mean, one it's easy to think about an engine and and the steel construction or aluminum construction, but the whole thing for us is actually the the intelligence, the 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 digital solutions that we build between different platforms or different systems and how they interrelate and systems of systems. And that is very much dependent on autonomy and AI and will become even more in the future. Next, please. So we have an intention from Team Sweden, including Vinova, Ericsson, Saab, Lynch University and many other universities and other companies to build something, grow something into in, into AI and autonomy and build a research innovation community as we have in aeronautics. And, and, to, to, and that community, we, we see that that link between industry and, and uh, different research programs and test programs and also government and universities and, and see how we can interconnect and make synergies. Um, and, and we have some opportunities to, to do that. We have, we have a, a, a guest research scholarship program. We have different mobility schemes of different kinds. We have, we have uh, different innovation weeks. We have uh, support from the, both governments to do a lot of different activities. But in practice, people has to get to know each other. And this is what this special event we have now is part of. So typically, we would, we would have had this live maybe somewhere in Brazil or in Sweden. And we'll have that next time when we get rid of the COVID. But we have had some initial activities. Uh, there is there is a community of uh, aeronautics related research universities and in Sweden and Brazil, Sark in Sweden, Barinet in Brazil. They have put up a competition for small companies, PhDs, or anyone basically on how can different flying objects collaborate in a smarter way, autonomously or using AI. So that is just launched that competition uh, and will will go on for a while. Uh, CISP has this workshop today, which is also a way to reach out and, and get to get to know people and, and so. And, and CISP is also planning a delegation to Sweden in uh, August. We cross our fingers that that's possible, or otherwise we will have it on later, which is an opportunity. Alessandra will talk more about that. And also, to we, we realize we have to be more specific, and, and we will propose, uh, I briefly mentioned it here, but, but in in the follow-on workshops, there is a there is one demonstrator project where we invite a few guest researchers to come to Sweden to Linge University and Saab and work on a specific project, and and we will we have an intention to set up a capability for data management for AI that we have developed, and we we I can talk a few more words on that, and then Ericsson Saab and Linge University and uh, potentially one or for more of the different AI centers that MCTI is uh, announced or is um, have a, had a call on could collaborate and, and develop a project on dynamic coverage coverage of you for you with UAVs looking at the flying mobile base station and or other uses uh, that we see and so on but some more words about the two first ones, and I hope Ericsson and Frederick Heinz from Lynch University will talk more about the latter one. So next, please. So Cacao is a, we at Saab see a need to better understand how could humans be in the loop of managing several different flying objects of the heterogeneous objects and and how can that mind machine interaction work uh, in a smart way and there are we we propose to make a couple of sub projects on that and and alessandra is promoting a guest research scheme that one can apply for during this uh, summer and and uh, could come to sweden next year for a year supposedly and collaborate with, with the Saab and, um, and Lynch University on these different subjects. Monitoring of human agents, uh, visualization and modeling for situated decision making, high level tasking, control of multi-agent systems with different professors. So if you have an interest in that, please go ahead, 
get in touch with these guys or check them up on the internet. Or you can talk to my colleague, Jens Alfredsson, that you see down there, and send an email and ask, what, what is this? Or hopefully you will be interested in and look into the workshops that we plan on the April 6th that CISP is arranging then. Next, please. This is a... <clears throat> This is a number of projects or ideas around Saab has developed a, a AI capability of how to collect and, and store and uh, compute and visualize uh, large amounts of data. Uh, and, and we are, it's like a product, but at the same time a, a, a tool or a lab set or something that could be applied to many different types of data. We have developed it mainly to, to run on compute different types of sensors. Uh, there are examples here to the right where we, we have uh, used uh, satellite images and, and to detect, let's say, wildfire or detect buildings in the jungle or uh, how, di how different uh, roads are developed over time or flooding or where are the people or where are the people in, in somewhere. And, and this, this is done through, let's say, stacking a lot of data, uh, store them both in, let's say, time and uh, uh, place, and, and be able to monitor that and also both, let's say, look historically and, and into the future, what will happen, what, what is normally the path of this aircraft and what is, a, what is something that, that's undifferent in that. So there are lots of different applications, and we plan to have a... Our intention is both to have, let's say, research around this, this capability, but also potentially to set up this lab in Brazil and, and work with that lab as, as, a, as, a, as a demonstrator place to, to show new technologies and new opportunities, new algorithms, etc. And we intend to have a workshop on that on April 12th or later to, to inform much more about that with the specialists on board. I think that's my final final picture, and um, with that, I would like to welcome you very much to look into the the great people that are in Sweden and in Brazil that relates to Sweden, and see how we can collaborate and hopefully develop different projects. Or if you have an interest, join in and see if you can be part of the projects I just proposed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Magnus. We have a time for one question. Uh, any participant would like to make one question? If yes, please raise your hands. No? So that's okay. Please feel free anytime to add the question in the chat or we, you can make the question to Magnus during the open session in the end. Now is the moment to ask, uh, to, to ask for the second presenter to make your presentation. That is Professor Fredrik Heinz. He will talk about overview of AI in Sweden. Please, Professor Fredrik. Thank you very much. Uh, so good uh, morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here. So my name is Fredrik Heinz and I'm an Associate Professor of Computer Science at Linköping University, uh, and I'm also the President of the Swedish AI Society, uh, which was formed in 1982. Uh, so that's basically how long we have been doing, or actually we started to do research in AI uh, already in the 70s in, in Sweden. Uh, but what I wanted to do here to, uh, right now to kind of set the stage a little bit is to talk about uh, what is AI research like in, in Sweden today, and what are the major uh, initiatives uh, in in this area? So, uh, as we, uh, as you probably are well aware, uh, AI kind of originated, so to speak, uh, within computer science and has uh, been a central part of computer science uh, for as long, at least as long as it's been around in Sweden. Uh, actually, there is an interesting kind of anecdote there that uh, uh, Eric Sandoval, uh, whom some of you might have heard of, uh, who, who um, was over in the US in the late 60s uh, to study with uh, John McCarthy and Marvin Minsky and these people. Uh, and when he came back to Sweden in the early, uh, yeah, around 1970, he became the first professor in Sweden of computer science. 
and he was also a AI, an AI researcher uh, with the consequence that AI has always been a very natural part of computer science in Sweden. However, it's also been the case that uh, since it's a natural part of computer science, it's not really been, has, has, has had a really strong identity of its own. Uh, uh, but, uh, but what we see today is that uh, this kind of computer science perspective on AI, which is kind of covered here on the uh, left side, uh, is broadening to also include ethical, legal, economical, social uh, aspects of AI, uh, touching upon the humanities and the social sciences, where we see a huge interest today uh, from these areas to study AI as a subject, but also to expand and improve on the kind of technical aspects of it as well. Uh, we also see a very strong trend towards using AI as a method and tool in other sciences. So for example, I myself have a project on uh, material sciences and how we're using uh, AI machine learning to automate parts of the process of uh, designing new two-dimensional materials. Uh, but uh, what we can say here is that AI is a broad uh, area. And we could also say that basically every university in Sweden has some form of AI research, and, and most of them have had AI research for a long time. Uh, and the same goes with the uh, topics that basically we cover more or less uh, every topic within AI. Uh, however, I would say that one of the key challenges has always been uh, volume. Uh, so coverage has been quite good, but it's been relatively few people. Uh, of course, this has especially been true in the, uh, I mean, say between the late 90s to, to uh, the first 10 years or so of the, 20, uh, the 2000s. Uh, of course, now we've seen the last five years, especially there's been a tremendous increase in the interest in, in, in AI and of course also to funding it, which is that Sweden is a very, very much expanding uh, its AI uh, research on, on all fronts. And here is a an overview of the uh, AI innovation uh, and research uh, landscape in Sweden. Uh, and, and what we see here is that kind of on the on the bottom here, the foundations uh, is provided by the universities. So here I've only listed seven. There are more universities, but uh, these are kind of some of the main main universities uh, in this uh, particular area. Uh, we then have a very large and very long term basic research program called the Wallenberg AI Autonomous Systems and Software Program, which is a 15 year um, 550 million euro uh, program. I, I will talk more about it shortly, but that's the main basic research program. Uh, the government also has had a special initiative called AI Competence of Sweden with the goal of uh, educating, providing professional education in the area of AI. Uh, and this has been geared both to increase the competitiveness of the private sector, but also to improve the welfare provided by the public sector. So it's been very clear that uh, both of these sectors uh, should be addressed. Um, so here have been developing courses and developing a national platform for professional uh, development and, and education in AI. Uh, then we have uh, what was uh, originally known as AI Innovation of Sweden, which is currently known as AI Sweden, which is the main um, uh, tool or I mean initiative towards innovation uh, when it comes to uh, doing knowledge transfer and uh, more most importantly to accelerate the use of AI in both the public and the private sector. And AI Sweden is to to a large degree funded by Vinova, uh, the innovation agency, uh, and uh, it's it's a public private partnership uh, with uh, uh, very many different uh, member organizations that all work together in setting up a national ecosystem around AI and around accelerating the use of AI. So I think this is a really uh, impressive initiative combining forces. Uh, and last but not least on this uh, um, slide here, I also have AI Sustainability Center, which is also funded by the uh, uh, Vinova Innovation Agency. Uh, and this is a organization where we help 
uh, companies and organizations to apply AI in an ethical and long term sustainable manner. Uh, so it's that's much more on the applied uh, research side. And uh, of course, Linköping University that I represent is involved in, in all of these different initiatives. Uh, so we became a university in 1975, but we have been around for longer. So actually, the main reason that Linköping University was started was Saab. Uh, when Saab uh, established their activities in Linköping, they of course needed an institute technology to provide uh, this high-tech company with the, the high-tech capabilities and competences. Uh, so, so then Linköping uh, Institute of Technology was started and then in 1975 it became a university and today is one of the leading universities in Sweden, especially when it comes to uh, AI and computer science. And I mean, Linköping University has been the home of AI, uh, as I said, since the 70s when, when Erik Sandvall became the first uh, professor of computer science. Uh, there is also other initiatives such as this VASP HS for VASP Humanities and Society uh, to study the, the uh, social and uh, human humanities related aspects of AI. So uh, I wanted to, of course, uh, talk more about this, uh, the Wallenberg AI Autonomous System Software Program, VASP, because this is uh, extremely uh, both important for Sweden and also I would say very impressive, if I may say so. Uh, and uh, and with a very strong backing of Swedish industry. So basically, um, this is uh, uh, to, a, to, the largest, uh, to a large degree funded by the Wallenberg Foundations, the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. Uh, so, and, and, and they may, so I mean, this is the, the, the family that owns uh, many of the major companies in Sweden, uh, including Saab and Ericsson and so on. And, and they realize that something is happening in the world and if we don't adapt and if we don't learn and if we don't build competence in this, we may have a, an issue in the future, even though we're doing quite well now. So the, the overall purpose of this program is really to do the basic research now, uh, which will allow Swedish industry to be competitive in the future. Uh, and so it's, it's a basic research program, but with strong connections to industry. So for example, Saab and Ericsson uh, have uh, people, uh, representatives on the board of this program, and they are also two of the largest uh, companies when it comes to having industrial PhD students and so on. So they're very much involved in this in this program. Uh, and as I said, it's a 15 year program with a total budget of about 550 million euros. And I really think this is key to think long term and to think strategically and to think about building competence. Uh, so it, uh, of course, has a research program with the best researchers, but I really think the key component here is the graduate school, which uh, has the goal of educating about 600 PhDs in the areas of autonomous system, AI, autonomous systems and software. And I'm the director of this graduate school. Currently, we have about 300 PhD students in the program, and we have like 15 or 20 or so that have uh, completed their degrees. So we started five years ago. So they're, the first batch is about to, to finish now. So what we will see is that roughly every year there will be 40, 50 new PhDs in this area coming out for the next 10 years. Uh, it's also about recruitment, in, uh, international uh, recruitment. So uh, we are establishing more than 60 new research groups and all of these researchers have to be recruited from abroad. Uh, so if you are a um, if you're interested, there are great opportunities to to come to Sweden and do really interesting basic research in collaboration with Swedish industry. Uh, and one of the key components of the VASP program is their AI research. So here we have identified four uh, different areas within machine learning and explainable AI and so on, and that's representation learning and grounding as one key topic. Of course, this is where you have a lot of this deep learning and so on for, for building representations of the complex world around us and using this for different purposes. Sequential decision making and reinforcement learning. Uh, so we will hear more about that in the in the talk after this, uh, which of course is very key if you want to plan if you're building autonomous systems like uh, airplanes or uh, trucks or cars and so on. You need to do this kind of sequential decision making and planning. Uh, third, uh, we're also very much interested in learning from small 
data sets. So of course we see the, the trend today is that the, the algorithms gets more and more data hungry and we want to uh, work against this to try to find other ways uh, of leveraging the information and data that we have more effectively. And here we also have other techniques like GANs and incremental learning and so on. And fourth, uh, multitask and transfer learning. So what we see today is mainly uh, solving is particular problems uh, and developing solutions for these particular problems. But of course that does not scale and it doesn't generalize. So how can we learn multiple tasks at the same time? Or how can we transfer what we learn for one task to other tasks? There's also a whole area on uh, developing the mathematics. So the developing new mathematical tools to study and develop uh, AI and machine learning. Uh, so this is also a super interesting uh, area within within BASP. Uh, there's, oops, there's also, as I said, this sister program called BASP HS, which is funded by a different uh, Wallenberg Foundation, namely Marianne and Marcus Wallenberg Foundation. Uh, and here the focus is really to study uh, different aspects of AI and autonomous systems, so the ethical aspects of AI and autonomous systems and the uh, legal aspects of AI and autonomous systems uh, and also economical aspects of AI. Uh, and this is then led by Virginia Dignum uh, from, from Umeå University, who is one of these uh, bus professors that was recruited to Sweden from uh, the Netherlands in, in her case. Uh, and I should also say that BUSP, uh, the director of BUSP is Anders Unnemann, uh, who is like a world uh, famous uh, researcher in, in visu scientific visualization, uh, who, who is leading the, the BUSP program today. And I just, I mean, this is kind of a boring slide, but it's a lot of the different, some of the initial projects in the BUSP HS. And the purpose here is just that you get the flavor of the breadth and depth of the, the, the projects that are going on. I'm highlighting the three because they are uh, involving the Linköping University researchers. And uh, the first one here is also in collaboration with Saab. Uh, so how basically it's about studying how to uh, manage and to develop these kind of complex intelligent systems uh, and how to deal with, with that from, from a kind of a management perspective. And personally, I'm involved in, in, a, in a project on AI transparency and consumer trust. So there we were, really want to understand what makes consumers and uh, people in general trust uh, AI systems and, and uh, be, feel safe about using them. Uh, as part of the VAS program, there is also an in, uh, in investment in infrastructure. Uh, so there will be actually there are two different major initiatives uh, when it comes to AI infrastructure, one within the VASP uh, kind of program and one uh, at Linköping University where we will get one of these NVIDIA pods with I don't know how many uh, of this, um, the, the, the most powerful NVIDIA supercomputer that you can buy these days uh, to really accelerate the use and the, uh, research and innovation when it comes to, to AI. Uh, so that's a little bit about Sweden. I also want to mention that Sweden, of course, is very active on the European uh, scene, uh, where there is a number of major initiatives going on. Uh, and um, I think the most uh, interesting one is the, this ICT48 networks, which are networks of research excellence centers, uh, which is part of the EU's excellence uh, initiative on AI, uh, where they want to establish networks uh, in major areas. So there's one in media, one in uh, machine learning within, uh, run by the Ellis uh, network, uh, one on humane AI, which is about the human AI interaction and so on. And one network that I'm leading called uh, Taylor on the, the, the where we are going to develop the scientific foundations for trustworthy AI. And that we will do that by integrating learning optimization and reasoning. Uh, and I also want to mention uh, CLEAR, which is a uh, grassroots initiative uh, with also with the members uh, from all around the globe uh, on really the striving for excellence in all aspects of AI for all of Europe and uh, uh, with this human-centered trustworthy focus. So uh, yeah, I, this network, uh, let's skip that. So to conclude, I would say that the, I think Sweden has a very, uh, starting to get a very good uh, ecosystem 
for uh, doing AI research and innovation, where their academia, industry, and the public sector is getting together. Uh, and what we see now is, of course, that we have we have really uh, trying to kind of consolidate and expand our kind of the the the, the competences and the efforts within the country. So the next step, of course, is now how can we uh, expand this collaboration to the rest of the world? Uh, I, as I mentioned, we are we are doing much more on the European EU level, and of course now we want to reach out to Brazil and uh, find collaborations because it's a very large country and you have very good uh, researchers. Uh, so I think there is a lot of opportunity for for joint work uh, in in this area. So. With that, I thank you for this. Uh, yeah, for this, and I am more than happy to take uh, questions on on this part, if there is some time left. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Patrick. Wonderful presentation about the AI ecosystem in Sweden, and also opportunities of to start collaboration with Brazil. Now we have time for the question, and we have one in the chat from Klaus Heiser. Uh, what is uh, how to start an activity in the context, context of the WASP? Uh, example, between the research department in a company and a group led by a professor at in the university. Okay. So, um, the, there are a number of different ways. I would say the, the simplest and, and in my experience, best way is to have uh, apply for an industrial PhD student. Uh, so that is uh, one of the main interaction points uh, between VASP and in industry is that the companies can apply uh, to get funding, partial funding for a PhD student who is employed by the company and then doing research in collaboration with the university. So I actually have two such uh, industrial PhD students with, uh, with uh, Saab. Uh, and one is directly funded by VASP and the other one is affiliated with VASP and he will do the next presentation after this one, Johan Shellstam. Um, so that I would say is the best. There is also research arenas, which I didn't talk too much about. I didn't talk them about uh, where you can also have collaboration more on the practical hands on side of things. You're thank muted. You no, thank you very much. No, it's OK. Thank you. Uh, also, Professor Marcelo uh, wanted to make a question. Please, Professor uh, Marcelo Finger. Can I talk instead of uh, typing? I prefer. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. You, thank you very much for your presentation. I am a uh, uh, professor of computer science at the University of Sao Paulo, also a principal investigator at the Center for Artificial Intelligence, this uh, uh, FAPESP IBM funded center recently inaugurated at the University of Sao Paulo, uh, in which I am the head of uh, natural language processing. But I'm more interested in uh, uh, kind of uh, inter, uh, in, in a relationship between institutions. So between our center and your uh, association of AI association or university or some sort of collaboration like that, how could that be worked out? institutionally so uh, what you're asking for is a uh, collaboration between uh, your research center and say for example in shopping university um so i mean uh i mean it's a, i think it's a difficult to give a, a very general answer on that but i think in, in some sense start in, we, let's start in, in the dialogue and i'm, I'm sure we can look into yeah. it so yeah um say so first, for instance first, if we we have ai applied to health and uh, COVID, for example, I have I, I lead the project and in that field. So, yeah. okay. So, so I would say that I mean a number of common. I mean that uh, of course starting small is one way. I just start to some kind of uh, collaboration on, on some particular topic, and which of course is one of the things we want to achieve with with this workshop. Uh, I identify and establish new collaborations. We're very much open to that. Uh, if we then want to kind of move on and have a more uh, established uh, collaboration between at the university level, I'm, I'm sure that can be discussed as well um, with, with with more people. OK, so uh, I'll, I'll send you an email when, when we do. start. OK, thank you. Thank you. And 
Professor Marcelo, if you wanna, we can book a call. Uh, CISB has a strong experience to support this collaboration between universities in Sweden and universities in Brazil. We can share my experience, okay? We are okay. working since 10 years ago, okay? In this okay. kind of activity to facilitate the collaboration, okay? It will be Thank a pleasure. You. So uh, I think that now uh, it's time to go to the another presentation. Thank you very much once and again, Professor Frederick. Okay. Uh, now uh, I'd like to ask Johan Kallström from Saab AB to make your presentation: Learning Agents for Improved Efficiency and Effectiveness and Simulation-Based Training. Please, Johan. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yes. My name is Johan Schellström. I'm a systems engineer at Saab, where I work with development of flight training system. And at the moment, I'm also pursuing a PhD at the Linköping University, and Fredrik Heinz is my supervisor. So in this talk, I'll present my project, which uh, studies uh, AI in the context of simulation-based training. So I will begin by presenting the problem. Uh, simulations that provide uh, virtual environments can make training more efficient since we don't need to use expensive physical resources. But in complex domains, we may still need a lot of human resources to populate and execute training scenarios. So to make training even more efficient, we would like to get rid of these training providers, uh, such as uh, instructors, role players and operators, and instead have uh, synthetic intelligent agents do their work or part of their work. So for example, we might ideally want to get rid of role players and operators altogether, while instructors may still be needed to some degree to uh, define the overall training goals. One challenge in constructing this type of highly automated training system is to build the behavior models for these agents. This is uh, recognized as uh, very difficult and you especially want. for, yeah, we only see part of your slide, unfortunately. Okay. The upper left part of it, but not, the, not the whole no, no. slide, if you could. Okay, maybe I'll just re-share. Re um. Is there any improvement? Or? No, it's the same. Okay, maybe uh, uh, Letitia can uh, share the slide instead. Or you, you want, if you, it, it seems to look quite okay if you don't use presentation mode, if that. Oh, so just like this? Yes. Okay, so sure, I'll do it like this. So uh, our intended contributions in this work is to study learning agents for improved efficiency and effectiveness in simulation-based training. Uh, so the goal is to simplify this process of developing uh, behavior models for the agents and to make it possible to build uh, smarter agents. This could make it possible to re uh, reduce the dependency on human training providers, and make it possible to realize more complex and relevant training scenarios, and also make it possible to realize individualized competence-based training instead of a one-size-fits-all solution. So I'll move on to our proposed approach. Um, in this work, we are studying two major categories of uh, synthetic agents. So the first one is uh, a synthetic trainer agent, which is uh, participating as a player in training scenarios. So kind of like a role player and interacting with the human trainees. The second category of agent is uh, a scenario adaptation agent. Uh, so this agent uh, observes the performance of trainees over time and adjust uh, the, the contents of the training scenario to provide uh, the kind of training that the human trainees, uh, trainees need at the moment. So this is, for instance, uh, adjusting the characteristics of the agents in the scenario. And combined, these two agents can be viewed as a kind of a synthetic instructor. As a case study, we are using a simulation-based air coma training system, which uh, provides uh, several challenges for this type of learning agent. So we have a mixed cooperative and competitive setting with many human as well as synthetic agents. 
We have uh, multiple conflicting objectives, uh, such as uh, tactical mission goals, resource consumption, and safety. We have a partial observability, and observability is also affected by the actions of the agent. So for instance, when operating sensor systems and similar uh, equipment. We have decision-making over long time horizons. So even simple tasks uh, require a long sequence of actions. And we have need for explainability to be able to conduct the briefing uh, of training sessions in a efficient manner. And finally, we have very limited real world data from air combat uh, for modeling. So due to this lack of data, we are primarily investigating uh, reinforcement learning approaches. And in particular, we're looking into multi-objective reinforcement learning, which is uh, an extension of standard RL that can handle multiple conflicting objectives. So in this setting, uh, the reward given to an agent is a vector, and each element of this vector represents uh, the performance in one of the objectives. And an optimal solution to this type of multi-objective problem is a set of policies uh, that is um, where each policy is optimal in the sense that uh, no other policy is uh, better in all objectives. And the value vectors produced by this set of policies uh, will generate the, the so-called Pareto front, which is uh, illustrated by the solid blue line in the image to the right. Uh, to optimize and select policies, uh, we use a utility function to scalarize this uh, vector value function. And there are two different optimization criteria. So the first one is uh, scalarized expected returns, which try to optimize the utility of several episodes. The second one is expected scalarized returns, which tries to optimize the utility of each individual episode. Uh, so in air combat, we might imagine that uh, a pilot wants to optimize his uh, safety in each individual mission, while a general or a politician might want to optimize the utility of all missions within a campaign. Uh, we have identified some applications for multi-objective reinforcement learning in training systems. So the first one is decision support. It may be difficult for an instructor, for instance, to define the desirable characteristics of an agent uh, through a reward function that can be used for reinforcement learning. So instead, we can train a set of agents with different characteristics and present them to the instructor to support his decision. A second use case is diversity. So by populating training scenarios with agents with different utility functions, um, the training uh, environment may be more stimulating to the human pilots. And finally, user adaptations. So we can select agents that are suitable for a certain trainee's uh, level of proficiency, for instance. And ideally, we would like the system to be able to use do this uh, selection based on observations of the trainee's performance. And in early work, we have developed a method where we integrate these utility functions or parameters that uh, uh, are used in the utility function as part of the agent so that we can use them as kind of tuning knobs after training to uh, adapt the behavior of the trained agents. Um, so I'll move on to some preliminary results using this method. So, uh, yeah, that slide should be hidden, yeah. So we have studied this method in um, a number of different environments. So initially we used quite simple grid world environments as those shown in this slide. Uh, so in the environment to the left, we have a kind of gathering scenario with two agents that uh, are aimed to collect the items that are in the center of the grid. And in this experiment, we could show that uh, the blue agent in the left corner, um, the utility function of this agent could uh, be adjusted after training to give the agent uh, uh, strictly competitive behavior, strictly generous behavior, or something in between. In the middle image, we have uh, a scenario where the blue agent should collect the two green items, 
while prioritizing between time and safety. And in this scenario, safety was defined as uh, the risk of colliding with one of the moving red agents in the center of the grid. And here we could uh, show that by adjusting the utility function of the agent after training, different movement patterns would occur that were more or less safe for the agent. So those are illustrated in the heat maps uh, to the right. So all in all, we could create quite diverse behavior uh, using only one policy that was adjustable after training, which uh, means that we need to use less training samples to, to train the agent. And we have also validated this approach in the target system, uh, studying adjustable risk taking in single and multi-agent scenarios. And we have shown that uh, by adjusting the agent's utility, uh, the agent will select different trajectories as illustrated to the left, and the agents will choose uh, different formations as illustrated to the right. So I'll wrap up with some directions for future work. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we have seen in this uh, application domain is uh, decision-making over long time horizons. So that's something that we are looking into now, how to handle this challenge. And we are primarily looking into different forms of hierarchical reinforcement learning that can allow us to break this problem down into sub-problems that may be easier to handle. We are also looking into how to build adaptive simulations. Uh, the methods we have now can create adaptable simulations, but uh, we still need human input to change the characteristics of the agents. So here we are studying and methods for modeling other agents' behavior. Uh, for instance, uh, the behavior of the human trainees and their current uh, uh, level of proficiency. And finally, we want to study human agent interaction in the target system to see how these types of agents could affect training value. So overall, the future work will focus on multi-objective aspects of learning, planning, and agent modeling in multi-agent systems. So that concludes my presentation, and I think we have two minutes or so for questions, if there are any. Thank you, Johan. You are totally right. We'll have two minutes for questions. And we have one in the chat from Professor Gianna Adamach, okay? Uh, the agent adaptation is just with the environment or with other agents? I would say it's primarily with other agents because we want to adapt uh, the behavior of the agents to fit uh, uh, the trainees that we're currently training. So it's, it's mostly about the interaction between human and synthetic agents, I would say. Yeah. It's the most uh, interesting because that's how how we do training with role players. The role players will get the instructions from the instructor how they should behave. You should be aggressive, defensive, uh, and so on. And while doing the training, they will try to adapt their proficiency level to be perhaps a bit better than the human trainee. So they yeah, they get a, a good opponent and they are able to learn. Thank you. Not using scalarization. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you need to do some kind of scalarization to, to compare different policies because you need, I mean, the scalarization is the utility which you need to use to, to be able to compare two policies. Um, but you can learn. Oh, yeah, great, great. But okay. what we, I mean, the directions we're using now, we learn a multi objective. Uh, state action value function, for instance, then after learning this function, we need to decide what's the utility for being able to select actions. So that's kind of the basic approach now. But I'll be happy to talk offline. Yes, okay. thank you. Thank you, Professor Dana. Okay, if uh, later on, I will share the contact of your with you, Professor Dana. Okay, so uh, time is moving fast and now uh, I think that is uh, time for the new presentation from Samuel Axon, from Ericsson. Okay, paving the way for 5G, the first AI functions in mobile networks. Please, Samuel, floor is yours. Thank you. So, do you see my screen sharing? Yes. 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 Good. Okay. So, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. My name is Samuel Axelsson. 
and I, I work at Ericsson Research. And as Magnus mentioned in the beginning, Ericsson Research is uh, uh, roughly 1,000 people, uh, some, some 700 plus. And uh, we are the part of, of Ericsson that has the most forward looking responsibility to do uh, technology scouting and uh, uh, identify uh, uh, concepts that have potential for the telecom industry and, and the Ericsson products then. So since uh, Johan and Fredrik will uh, uh, talk and present a bit about method research, uh, we thought that we from Ericsson could provide some uh, the application domain and, and sort of the, uh, uh, the need and the uh, uh, impact that we see that uh, AI technology is having from, from our perspective. Uh, but at Ericsson Research, I sh should highlight that we do both method, method research and uh, applied research in our work. Okay, so let's jump into it. Um, just to give you some feeling for uh, the, the challenge in, in radio networks, uh, we thought we could present some numbers. Uh, so these are numbers that are relevant for a 4G network with some 10 million subscribers. So not active users, but uh, uh, people living in, in that area, so roughly Sweden, the, the whole country of Sweden, or the, the single city of uh, uh, Sao Paulo, for example. And then we're talking about um, numbers in the order of some uh, uh, 700 million web pages being downloaded every day, some 40 million videos being watched. Um, in radio network, the most valuable asset that we have is the uh, radio frequency, the, the spectrum over air. So that we really, really want to utilize and, and optimize the usage of. So that means as soon as a user is not active or not very active at least, we tear it down the, the connection that the user has in order to make room for another user. So that means that uh, if you click a web page and don't do anything else, your, your connection will be taken down and then set up again uh, and as fast so, so you will not notice it, but to make room for, for other connections in the background. So typically some, some 66 million uh, internet sessions going on in, in a day then, and uh, uh, then we have these radio sessions that, that are even faster than that, that I mentioned from a, a system perspective. Then very central in a radio network is the mobility that you should be able to move around and still use your phone or tablet or whatever you're having. So in, in a network this size, we're talking roughly some 300 million handovers then. So this is users that are in active mode, performing a phone call, watching a video or something like that, uh, that then are moving in the network. The stationary users typically don't need to, to perform handovers. We'll come back to this handover aspect because the first AI feature that was sort of branded as, as AI with um, and, and, and using such methods uh, was to, uh, to improve and, and um, uh, optimize the handover performance in our networks. But roughly then some, some 100 terabytes per day uh, in, in the whole network and then some uh, uh, 1 million events per second happening that, that we need to handle. So this means that the radio network is an extremely uh, an extreme example of a distributed system where we have millions of users, millions or at least thousands of base stations and then uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, uh, more central nodes as well um, that, that uh, need to be coordinated. So that is for one uh, aspect that we're seeing is, is being very relevant is the distributed learning, for example, that, that we see uh, huge potentials of when it comes to, uh, to radio network applications. Okay, so all of these numbers uh, may sound quite big, but uh, these numbers are actually from 2017. Uh, some of the numbers only scale with maybe a factor two to five. Uh, while others actually scale with uh, a factor of 50 or 100. So for example, today, since 2017, the video traffic is actually representing some uh, uh, two thirds of the, uh, uh, of the internet traffic in total and in mobile networks as well. Uh, and the, the traffic in general in, in mobile networks today is uh, roughly one third of the all internet traffic is, is path, passing through mobile networks or radio networks. Uh, 
and where is this increase coming from then that that uh, uh, that we see with this factor yeah between one or 50 and five then um, it's uh, video traffic is one part but we're also seeing that the diversity in use cases and applications on on how radio networks are are being used is being broadened to uh, uh, to a very large degree so on on the bottom here it is something we refer to enhanced mobile broadband and and this is really uh, the stuff that we do today but in a more extreme way so it can be higher resolutions it can be uh, virtual reality and so on but but more of the same so to say but then we have a, a huge area with very simple devices that should be low cost extremely low power um, or extreme energy efficiency uh, and so on and uh, this is um, one example is the the smart cities initiative for example that we're discussing in this uh, uh, Sweden and Brazil collaboration, which falls into this uh, domain of being uh, not the most uh, uh, critical situations. Maybe it could be that for in, in smart cases applications as well, but, but typically a, a bit less and, and rather that it's scaling to many users instead. But then we have the other side of the spectrum and, and here uh, Saab typically uh, comes in and, and have uh, application areas. So, for example, if we talk about defense system where we have a critical machine type communication with um, maybe not as many uh, uh, devices as, uh, as on the left side, uh, but the, the, the reliability is extremely important and latency requirement and so on can, um, are typically extremely important in, in those applications. And then we've also discussed uh, uh, drone applications for uh, for different purposes, and they uh, may be a bit in the middle here. It, it depends on the exact uh, uh, application that you would use it for. But so compared to 2G, 3G, 4G, where we typically have two services, voice and mobile broadband, we're now moving into uh, having a much richer um, uh, diversity in, in the use cases that we need to handle with radio networks. So what does this then mean for, for us as, as a provider? Uh, it is really an exponential uh, development when it comes to the complexity that needs to be handled. So uh, in order to handle the increased capacity, operators need to deploy more and more frequency layers. Uh, every 10 years or so, we, we develop a new um, uh, network generation. Uh, so typically operators have, have a mix of, uh, of different technologies in their network. Uh, and the technologies as such become more and more uh, complex uh, in order to utilize the, the, the frequency spectrum that I mentioned before, that is the most valuable asset. In order to utilize that uh, more and more efficient, we, uh, uh, we increase the complexity as well. But this is not sustainable from, from a customer perspective and from us as being end users. We don't accept paying more and more subscription fees and so on. So, from a management perspective, we really need to, to break this curve. Uh, and that is where AI and AI methods is a really, really fundamental um, uh, part in, in making that happen. So from an operator perspective, they need to be able to manage their networks without uh, increasing the, the cost and, and, and their effort in, in, in doing so, uh, to the same extent as they need to increase the capacity that they provide to, to us as end users. So it both from a cost perspective, but also from a practical perspective, it will not be possible for, for humans to, to do this uh, um, uh, fine granular uh, optimization that, that, that we are entering from 5G and in, in future generations as well. So this is where uh, AI is, is a critical part. Coming back to, to the aspect of trustworthiness that, that Fredrik brought up and, and mentioned in the beginning from an end user perspective that we can relate very strongly to uh, from, from an Ericsson perspective, but not only to the end user, but also to, to an operator in between. Uh, that it, it's an attitude and, and the trust that has been developed over time. So if we back some 25 years ago, it was quite reluctant to uh, uh, to have any automatic feature that then or function 
then it was uh, uh, acceptable, so to say, with uh, having automated data collection, but any adjustments want, the operators wanted to do manually. But this we see has, has uh, then developed over time. And today there's no question about that, that uh, uh, everyone wants and have, have accepted uh, full automation. It's more a matter of maybe which functions that should be automated in which order and, and who should do it. So now we are in a phase where we focus quite a bit on DevOps. So uh, developing features and functions together with operators and, and using their networks as uh, uh, a, a testing field, for example. And you one mentioned, for example, in, in his presentation that uh, uh, data being very critical and in some cases we, we, we don't have access to, to data. And uh, operating in a DevOps uh, way is then an enabler to, to make us uh, access real live data and, and develop functions that are um, as, as relevant as possible. So, so the uh, sort of discussion aspects and so on today is as, as Fredrik mentioned in his part as well, uh, a, a lot about this um, uh, privacy aspect from an end user uh, perspective, making sure that it's done in an ethical and, and good way, but also from an operator perspective that it's uh, done from a, a business strategic uh, uh, good way. So, so uh, that sensitive information is not disclosed to, to other competitors, for example. So it's, it's both from end user perspective and from a business perspective. Then from Ericsson, we are looking into automation and optimization in many different timescales. Um, and uh, it, it can range from planning activities that are more long term. Uh, so going back to the example that you one showed with, with some route planning and so on, uh, it, it is maybe in, in the time scale here. Uh, but then we also have automation and activities inside our base stations. And then it's um, on, on seconds or millisecond level that, that we talk about automation. But, but in general, we, we see th there is a need to, to, um, uh, to uh, address all, all of the different timescales that, that are visualized on, on this slide. Uh, then I think we will skip this slide actually to save a bit of time. So uh, the first AI feature then that was introduced, this was back in, in around 2016, 17 and so on, where, where we uh, did the research on it and we thought it could be interesting to, uh, to present that and, and uh, be able to mention that we have now come full circle and, and this is functionality that is running uh, live in, in the networks uh, all around the world. Um, and um, uh, so it was introduced, the uh, first formally um, uh, AI uh, uh, label features in uh, a few years back then. And the background is that the radio frequency um, environment is very dynamic. So what is illustrated on the right side here is uh, theoretical uh, cell coverage. So from different base stations, what coverage we have. In practice, it doesn't look at all like this. If, if, if you have a building that will block your radio channel, even if you're st standing still, um, you will be subject for uh, different kinds of fading uh, that will make your, your radio channel constantly uh, changing. Uh, and and this, is, this is physics, so this is something we, we just have to live with and, and try and compensate as, as best we can. Uh, then we mentioned before that operators typically uh, deploy many different frequency layers in order to increase the capacity in the networks. And then we mentioned we have different technologies, 2G, 3G and so on. This means that in practice, uh, in, in a certain area then, we typically have a, a, a very heterogeneous kind of coverage. So different cells covering different areas and so on. And, and this is uh, something that we, um, we then want to balance all these millions of users that we have in a good way. So we need to steer them to different frequency layers and different cells. And this is where AI comes into play because in order to, to push a user from one frequency layer to another, we typically need to do measurements that cost time and cost effort. Uh, and that uh, if, if a user is starting to lose coverage, there is a risk to, to actually drop uh, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the call, which is not uh, acceptable, of course. Uh, so 
what we do is that we uh, uh, we use AI to to uh, uh, do fingerprinting. So based on uh, signal strength that the, that the user is measuring on the current frequency, uh, we in a learning phase can build up um, a uh, a map or a model of the predicted uh, signal strength on other frequency layers. And that way, in, in critical situation, we can rely on these models instead of having to do a measurement that takes time uh, in, in those situations. So the outcome of, of this application then is faster handover time uh, between uh, when we move between different frequency layers in the orders of some, some um, uh, 60%. We get more robust handovers. We don't have to wait. So be, since we can move faster, they also become more robust since we don't have to move into worse and worse coverage before having time to, to act on the handover. Uh, before, we typically had to select the, the first frequency that, that was reasonable or OK. Uh, but now we can select the best one. And uh, the, uh, the AI functionality in this case is, um, was done a few years back. The method was uh, gradient boosting uh, uh, decision trees. Uh, not super advanced, but for this application, it had the best performance versus complexity trade-off compared to uh, much more uh, advanced methods that, that we looked at as well. This, this functionality, data collection, training, uh, Inference, taking actions, life cycle management of models, all of that is, is done within each base station in the network that we have. And, and this is running live since a few years back then in our radio networks. Uh, yes, let's see, where are we time wise? End of time or? Yes. Yes. But one minute we are, please. Yeah. Uh, then I, I will just wrap up, wrap up by, by saying that uh, at Ericsson we have a dedicated uh, organization that, that work with AI methods, as I mentioned in the beginning. That organization is, is represented in, in Brazil and also in this meeting, uh, even though I myself happen to sit in, in Linköping in Sweden. Uh, we also do a applied AI in all um, uh, research areas at, at Ericsson and in Brazil we also have networks uh, represented as a research area. Uh, then we have uh, hundreds of, of data scientists and that was the slide that I skipped that, that helped the rest of the organization to, to actually apply AI and, and enable us working at Ericsson Research to, to focus on the forward-looking research. And as I mentioned before, already in 5G, we see that, that AI application is um, very central. But in, in 6G, uh, it will be native already in the standard. And the topics that you see here, you, you can for sure relate to, uh, to the aspect that Fredrik mentioned in his part re uh, regarding explainable and trustworthy AI distributed intelligence and so on. So this was one example where we looked at research that we did some five years ago that is now uh, deployed in field and the research that we do in this collaboration we then expect to be out in in field in some some five to ten years ahead in time so that was it on my side sorry for using a bit of extra time uh, don't worry samuel so uh samuel you have a question in the chat Okay, and now is the time for our um, cough break. And okay, we will stop the workshop for five minutes for the break. Okay, if you wanna, you can answer in the chat during the break, or we can come back during the open discussion. Okay, so we will come back in five minutes. Okay, it's our break time. Thank you very much.
Hello, everybody. Yeah, good. Good. Job. Let's come back to the workshop. OK, uh, now I'd like to invite once again Professor Fred Heinz to make a presentation. OK, learning re reasoning with trajectory data. Please, Professor Fred. Floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, okay. So welcome back. Uh, let's see. Yes, uh, so uh, in the, the, the talk I gave before, it was only, or I mean, it was about giving a broad overview of uh, work being, AI research being done in, in Sweden. What I want to do now is to dive a bit more down into the concrete research that uh, uh, I am doing uh, together with my, my group. Uh, so uh, my group is called the Reasoning and Learning Group, and we currently have six PhD students. I mean, you met one of them, Johan Chelsdom. Uh, already uh, and two postdocs and we are really doing a uh, research so we kind of started out in the area of more traditional knowledge representation so i've been doing a lot of work on temporal logics and what we call stream reasoning so doing incremental reasoning over streaming data uh, we have then expanded uh, both towards uh, machine learning so we've done a lot of work in the intersection between uh, reasoning and learning and we've also been doing more and more work in the area of uh, multi-agent uh, systems, 
Uh, and so, for example, Yuan's work, I think, fits very well in this intersection between machine learning and multi-agent systems. Um, so, uh, the, and the applications that we have been working with, so we've been working a lot with uh, autonomous systems, uh, unmanned aircraft systems. We had fully autonomous unmanned aircraft systems more than 15 years ago. Uh, so you see the helicopter there, there was a 100 kilo helicopter. Uh, where we could do fully autonomous flights and we did uh, also cooperative flights uh, with the two of these and also interacting with humans and uh, first responders and so on. Uh, and there we've really been uh, using these techniques to uh, make sure that they are safe. So about runtime verification and execution monitoring of these systems, traffic monitoring, understanding uh, what's going on when, for example, having a downward looking camera from a helicopter. Uh, we've also been applying our multi-agent systems work to real-time strategy games. So uh, the algorithms that we have developed are commercially used in uh, real-time strategy games. And uh, we also have Yuan's works on training simulations. Uh, so the overarching theme or uh, of the, the research that we're doing is really to uh, understand, make sense of what's going on and to make decisions in real time. And we do that through incremental learning and reasoning over streaming information. So we're really interested in this kind of online setting uh, rather than kind of storing things to databases and, and as, asking questions to them. We want to do things online as they happen uh, to be able to capture uh, developing and uh, changing phenomena. Uh, so what I want to talk a little bit about here is the three uh, areas. Learning generative models based on trajectory data probabilistic logical reasoning over observed and predicted trajectories, and also privacy preserving synthetic trajectory data uh, generation. So when it comes to uh, learning, so one thing that we're really interesting is uh, learning things on multiple different levels. So for example, taking this, I mean, this uh, <coughs> is an example of um, uh, uh, GPS tracks. Uh, of cars driving through an intersection. So the color here de de determines the speed or yeah, represents the speed. Uh, so we can see that basically two patterns here, either going straight or turning left uh, in this intersection. So what we want to do uh, or what we can do is to uh, learn models which combine the dynamics of the actual movements. Uh, so here we use Gaussian processes to capture the dynamics. Uh, and then we create graphs of these uh, graph, uh, Gaussian processes to represent the kind of transition between different motion patterns. Uh, so this we have done. Uh, and then of course the next step is to have some kind of labeling, understanding the semantics behind these different uh, uh, motion patterns, but that's, that's still work in progress. Uh, so basically the way it works is that we can incrementally build these graphs uh, representing the different movements. So uh, in the image here, we see a, a, a model of uh, environments. So this is basically our UAV flying around in a grid pattern. Uh, so basically each uh, edge in this graph is a Gaussian process representing dynamics of the movement between those pair of uh, nodes. And the nodes represent choices where you switch between activities. Uh, and then we can extend this model uh, by observation. So here we have a new trajectory, blue in this case. So we see that it follows the trajectories uh, or the, the kind of existing model uh, for the first three uh, legs of this trip. But then we see that it deviates. Uh, and then we can expand this model and add new edges uh, representing new motions, motion primitives uh, for this. And in this way, we can then uh, continually expand and improve the model based on uh, new observations. And what we can do now with this kind of models is that giving a, an observations, we can uh, classify. So what uh, motion primitive is an uh, object doing? We can do predictions. So what are likely futures? And of course, we can make this kind of similarity measures. If it's too different to the existing model, we can then extend it. So that's one example of building multi uh, uh, representations on multiple levels. Uh, we can then also use these kind of models uh, to reason over both observe and predict the trajectory. So as I said, we've been doing using this kind of traditional 
temporal logics to do uh, execution monitoring, it's monitoring the observed past behavior, which of course is nice, but what's even better is to be able to uh, monitor the predicted future. So we can say that uh, if you don't change your behavior, you're likely to end up in a bad situation. And we also want to explicitly deal with the uh, probability or this kind of uncertain information in our logical reasoning. So what we have done is that we have extended signal temporal logic uh, into a probabilistic signal temporal logic, which also allows us to refer to predicted future uh, events. So we could deal with both uncertainty and predictions. So for just to give an example of what we can do, so assume that we have uh, the estimation of the altitude is the probability distribution to the right. Uh, so if we only look at the kind of uh, most probable value, uh, and, or, and then we want to make sure that we're never flying below three meters altitude. Uh, if we just take the, the, the mean or the most likely, the most probable value, it would be true because the average uh, is above three. But now what we can say instead is, is the probability it should always be the case that the probability of being above three meters is at least 99%. And in this case, that's not true because a sufficient amount of the probability distribution is below three meters, so therefore this would be false. We can then also refer to future uh, observations. Uh, so for example, it should be the, the probability that the, the, the altitude in two seconds from now should be above three meters with 99% uh, probability. So now we can refer to future. We can also refer back so we can say things like, uh, I mean, we have this probabilistic I showed you. We could also do introspection, namely they can say that uh, is the distance or sorry, the, the altitude that we predicted close enough to the observed uh, altitude five seconds later. So can this five second uh, prediction, is it good enough? And then we can actually start to monitor the quality of our predictions, for example. We can also do anticipatory reasoning to uh, predict if it's likely to occur a collision in the future. So, so this is a very nice and, 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 and powerful uh, system for, for doing that. Uh, the, the third part is uh, privacy preserving synthetic trajectory data generation. So here we're working with applications, for example, where you have a telecom provider, such as, I mean, for example, telecoms, cust uh, sorry, Ericsson's customers. Uh, they have uh, position information uh, about the, their customers that they don't want and are not allowed to share, but still they want to be able to provide services based on this uh, position information. Uh, and what we do then is that we learn generative models using uh, GANs, generative adversarial network models, uh, to learn these kind of motion patterns. And then we can generate synthetic uh, motion data or mobility data. And this uh, uh, synthetic data does not is not able to trace back to any individuals, so we don't have this. Uh, so it's basically non-sensitive mobility data that still captures the kind of essence uh, of this mobility. Uh, so, so this is one application that we're uh, been working with. Uh, so that was kind of a summary of the, the some things we've been doing. I added one extra slide here also because I think we're also very much in this co in potential collaboration. We're also very much interested in multi-agent systems. Uh, so, so one part that we've also been doing is what's called utilitarian combinatorial assignment. Uh, and here, sorry, just closing the window since the kids are playing outside. Um, um, that uh, here, we're, what we're interested in is basically given a set of agents and giving a set of tasks how can we <clears throat> form coalitions, teams of these agents, and assign these uh, teams to tasks so that this is <clears throat> optimal, that we optimize uh, the value for this, <clears throat> the utility for this. Uh, and uh, what we have then developed is then state-of-the-art exact algorithms, ex state-of-the-art uh, heuristic algorithms that was uh, presented at uh, AAAI this year. And now we're looking into how can we generate heuristics using deep learning uh, that was uh, presented at the Taylor workshop, and we still we also have a paper about this on the review for HK, uh on on how to learn these heuristics uh, to to scale these up to thousands of agents compared to I mean tens of agents that we could do uh, optimally exactly. So uh, and and kind of looking one step further, 
uh, so I mean, this is work that we have been doing and are doing. What I really think is the, the future here is to go from a uh, um, correlation based method to causality based methods uh, and to base these models both on the observed data, but also on knowledge and explicit assumptions and to use these causal models to explain the past and to predict the future. Uh, and here I really think is the kind of uh, five, five to 10 year kind of plan. And I know that uh, many people are working on this, including people in Brazil uh, and so on. So I think that's really interesting future. So to conclude, uh, we, uh, our group, the My Reasoning and Learning Group, we're really interested in this intersection between knowledge representation, machine learning and multi-agent systems. We are working with a wide range of different techniques uh, and I really think we have a great competence in several of these and, and, and we're also very much hands on. We actually implement and test and uh, yeah, even fly things. Um, so I think that's really nice. And of course, what we're interested in one major area that uh, uh, Magnus was presenting in his uh, opening talk is really this on collaborative autonomy. How can we get multiple autonomous uh, entities to work together uh, and to solve really challenging problems and to adapt in these very uncertain uh, situations uh, with uh, limited centralized control uh, and so on. And I really think to address these uh, challenging issues, we really need this combination of multiple uh, techniques from multiple areas. And I really think this is a great opportunity. And of course, we are super interested in, in, in collaboration because, I mean, by, by covering a broad area, it also means that uh, uh, there is a lot to learn uh, from many different uh, people. And we really love learning and to uh, build new connections and expand the work that we're doing. Uh, and of course, uh, making it uh, deeper and more uh, interesting as well. So uh, with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I think now it's time for a discussion, unless there are some direct questions. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Fred. In fact, we have one more presentation that is my presentation. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so there is a question on uh, motion. Yeah, but so I mean, we are also looking, uh, have been looking more at towards the traffic. So actually, we had a collaboration with the local uh, bus uh, company, and there there was interested in, I mean, basically understanding what are the consequences if you add a bus stop, if you remove a bus stop, or actually thinking more in this macroscopic uh, way. Uh, and I mean, this uh, origin destination matrices actually that's part of what we use for for this uh, synthetic trajectory data generation uh, so so we have been yeah touching upon that at least uh, in in several of the, the the things that we have been doing so yes it's definitely interesting okay thank you uh, I want to share my my screen okay let's see Can you see my slides? No. Nope. Not yet. Not yet. Wow. No, it's coming, I think. And, and now? Ah, OK. So uh, now is the time of the presentation of CISB. I'm the manager of, director of Swedish Brazilian Research Innovation Center. It's an opportunity for us to, to say some words about opportunity of connection with AI partners in Sweden. That ones that you met today, okay? First, I will say some words about CISB, okay? CISB is a no-profit organization. We were founded in May uh, 2011. We will celebrate 10 years. We have members in Sweden, in Brazil. Today we have Saab, Lin Shopping University, Suzanne with us. It's a pleasure. And we work as an innovation platform, we call. That means we facilitate the cooperation in several sectors. And now, as uh, Regina Summer said in the beginning, Vinova, okay, also we are facilitating the cooperation in bioeconomy, in health, in sustainable mining, 
and smart cities and not only aeronauts but also in AI that is very broad I can say we will see AI in everything in a close future okay yes so opportunities of connections first we had a call uh, opening that was open in December it's a partnership with CNPq and Saab okay what we are offering is some mobility for AI researchers from Brazil or startup researchers, okay? Uh, we will finance five-day trips in Sweden, probably in August, okay? We need to see also to check the situation of the pandemic. And during the five-day trips in Sweden, we will have an excellent agenda, okay? Uh, you can check in our hot site. There is a preliminary agenda some study visit to visit Sabi, Ericsson, also Vinova, and also to go to Lean Shopping Universe to be closer to several opportunities in AI and also to discuss some possibilities of uh, future projects, okay? Our idea is to use all, all of our experience in start a community in AI, Brazil, Sweden, it's important. The deadline for the application is April 20, okay? Uh, if you want more information, more details, please check in our hot site, send a message to us. It will be a pleasure to interact mainly with the Brazilians, okay? Second opportunity. We have a very success story. It's a partnership CDPQ CISBSAP, okay? We started the, that in 2012, okay? In the, in the product called Size Without Borders, okay? In that time, uh, we had a specific um, agreement, CNPq says Saab, involved 100 scholarships, okay? Most of them were, were dedicated to aeronautics and was very important, what is very important to say, was uh, the beginning of the community, of the collaboration, and nowadays, the aeronautics cooperation is very well developed. It was a very top-down um, cooperation, and the researchers Brazil with are working very well. Okay, and now we are in the second momento, the second phase of the agreement. We will have a new call probably launched in June. Depends of the pandemic. We are in negotiation with CNPq and Saab, and we will offer seven scholarships postdoc and three scholarships sandwich in Sweden, one year in Sweden. And probably uh, this guest research will start in Sweden only next year, so probably in March, April, something like this, okay? And of course, AI is one of the main areas of this new call, okay? Uh, and we have um, had excellent results in terms of collaboration, institutional collaboration, and also the basement of the project portfolio between the countries. And as Magno said in the beginning, we have an agenda. We have several workshops. Today is the first one, okay? But we will have two more in AI, okay? In April 6, we will have the second workshop. The folks will be in Cacao Project, Central Asset Control and Operation. All of you will be invited, okay? And also another specific groups in Brazil, okay? And the third one is uh, will be in April 12, okay? It will be in the top the data management for AI, okay? It's another opportunity for you to know more about the initiative, about the challenge that we have, and we are totally open for any kind of questions, okay? And also in our agenda, we have another in very interesting uh, activity that we call Sweden Brazil Startup Match Day Online that is funded by Vinova under the umbrella of the project ISB. Nowadays we are calling Brazilian corporations if they want to match to uh, Swedish startups, okay, the event will be May 26. We are the partners, CISB, in the Brazilian side and Ignite Sweden is the partner, the facilitator in Sweden. We are very happy and now we are going to the second edition of this initiative, okay? And hope to have the AI delegation, the Brazilian AI researchers in Sweden with us in August, okay? If we have a problem with the pandemic, we have a plan B. 
we can postpone this probably to October, but we will talk with all of the researchers involved and actors, okay? And in October, we will have the third edition that of Brazil Sweden Innovation Week in Sweden, that is led by Brazilian Embassy, okay? And in November, we will have a new edition of Sweden Brazil Innovation Week in Brazil, led by Swedish Embassy in Brazil. So, as you can see, several activities between Sweden and Brazil. Uh, I'm here. If you wanna, uh, we can talk about. It's a pleasure. Okay. And now you can see my contacts. Okay. Feel free to contact me anytime for any kind of questions. Okay. So, this was my presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe uh, Regina, are you still around? Yes, yes, I'm here. I'm here. May maybe you can mention, though it's for Swedes to apply, but maybe you can mention this uh, AI mobility that that we know is poss possible to fund. Yeah, great idea. Uh, so Vinova opened a call, uh, actually it was in, the, uh, in conjunction with the Sweden Innovation Days in, in November last year. We opened a call called uh, a Staff Exchange, focusing on AI. Uh, so the applicant has to be a Swedish organization. But what you apply for is to having either one of your staff members in your organization, a Swedish organization, going to Brazil to you know, pick someone, some AI expert's brain for uh, six months and then coming back, bringing back the knowledge to Sweden. But you can also be a Swedish organization in Sweden, having pinpointed an expert in Brazil that you would like to join your organization for a period of six months in Sweden. So it goes both ways, uh, but the applicant has to be, I mean, a, a Swedish organization. So, and, and, and that call is open, um, I mean, we, we evaluate every four week, every fourth week. So, you know, something, we don't want to complicate the, the, the evaluation process too much. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's open all the time until the money is uh, finished. <laughs> so, if, if, for example, Friedrich Heinz at Lynch University or someone at Saab or Ericsson or someone else finds a good friend in Brazil who has an interest to go to Sweden, they can apply and you respond in one, two months maybe, and then you could come to Sweden for and, and use this money. And that money, is that only for traveling or is it for other costs? Yes. It's it's a top. It's a it's a, um, a maximum amount of five hundred thousand Swedish crowns. Uh, what could that be? Could that could that be about three hundred thousand like, real? Three three hundred thousand reals right now. Reals. Okay. Something good. Like uh, yeah, something like that. And it is for travel costs, living costs, a little bit of salary. But I mean, you can you do the math. It, 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 it's you know. It, it, that that's the limit. Um, we have one example. Ericsson is already doing this. We had an application last year with Canada. Very happy for that. So it was it's Ericsson and and KTH that has uh, pinpointed professors from uh, Concordia University, for example, that are supposed to come to Sweden uh, as soon as they can. So uh, please. Look into it. You can find everything on Vinova's website. You find it in Swedish, of course, and we also have a shorter text in, in, in English. And any questions, please, I'm, I'm going to put my contact details in the chat and you're more than welcome to, to, to contact me. And, and I would be so happy if we had a, a, a Brazil case. Uh, that would be great. So please contact me. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you, Regina. Uh, now is our final session. It's the time for open discussion. Okay, uh, please let me know if someone wants to make a question. Please uh, raise your hands, and the discussion is open for everybody, Swedes and Brazilians. Please.
Alessa Alessandra? Yes. I have a question to Regina. Regina, about this call that it's open. So, Maria, uh, may, may you introduce yourself, Maria? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> So uh, I'm uh, uh, Maria Valeria Marquezini. I work at Ericsson in Brazil. I'm responsible for this um, coordinating the research projects that we have in cooperation with the uh, universities here. I've been doing that for a very long time. So uh, many of you already know me from previous projects, right? And some of you are, are new to me. So, uh, okay. It's that just a, a short introduction about myself. But Regina, I was wondering if this um, call that is open, is it uh, the host in institution uh, should be only a university or could be also, uh, for example, Ericsson in no, Sweden uh, or in Brazil, for example? Yeah, no, that, that's uh, with this call, we were trying to, you know, um, try to add on something that uh, was not available at the moment uh, and because I know that there has been a lot of mobility programs focusing on academia and academia what we want to open up is for anyone going to anyone the importance is that the you know the level of AI competence has to be top-notch uh, so it doesn't matter if it's an industry or an other kind of uh, association or but um yeah no so it can be that, that's the, that's the, the the lovely thing with this call i would say that it, it doesn't have to be academia academia so yes ericsson can absolutely apply like i said in the one we have with canada right now is ericsson and um, and the concordia university in um, in in canada but so and the ones applying are ericsson they are the host yeah great thank you yeah, welcome. Yeah. Welcome to apply. <laughs> Follow-up question on that. This is Bjorn Johannesson from Ericsson. So I'm, I'm heading one of the research parts within Ericsson. And follow-up on that is, I mean, we are in a quite special situation now with COVID and so on. If we apply, is that, uh, I mean, can we have an application in and then when it's possible to travel, that we, we make the travel at that time? Or, or do we have to... to have a certain point in time when this visit needs to be uh, taken. How, how do you uh, see that? No, uh, we will force you to to travel <laughs> <laughs> regardless of the risks. No, uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, we, of course, have that in mind. I mean, with the Concordia and Ericsson application, we have changed the, 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 the time for starting up and everything. Uh, uh, so no, uh, you apply now. Uh, that is a very good idea, and then um, we adapt uh, mm. based on what happens around the world. Uh, yep. The only thing that we say a uh, big no-no to is because some have asked us, okay, but if we have the the partnership and the knowledge transfer digitally, well, go ahead, but you're not going to get this grant. This is you really, you know to being part of an organization for six months, uh, learning the organization, learning uh, from the people and creating the networks that we want to build. So. Yeah. I think you mentioned six months. I think, is it one to six months? It's, it, it cannot be less than one month. It's up to six months. And But I mean, uh, I'm, I'm using this Canada example because I don't have that many <laughs> examples. But um, with the Canada one, I know that they, they want, we're going to go back and forward in, in different, uh, like two or three timings, and that would be during a year. But the funding is top for, you know, maximum six months in, in total in time and in spending. But it can be, I mean, you can spread it out during a year. Yeah. I have a question. In, continuation, yeah. in, in continuation of this top, I think that we need to find a way to work virtually. My question is to Professor Frederick. Okay. How is possible to start any kind of collaboration in a virtual way with the Brazilian researchers? Professor, can you share with us a case what we are doing right now in uh, Lean Shopping as an example? 
So, I mean, I, I present uh, basically an overview of uh, most of the research that, uh, I mean, for example, I'm doing in, in my research group. And actually, we have uh, weekly seminars exactly this time <laughs> in my group between one and three on Swedish time on, on Thursdays. And I would be more than happy to either invite uh, any of you to give a talk uh, or uh, we are also happy to set up that we present uh, what we are doing in a bit, I mean, more technical detail for an interested audience. So that would be the, a really simple thing to do. And I mean, I actually think it's a benefit. I mean, that uh, probably had more people attending this event today than if we would have been uh, uh, live, I mean, in, in, in person somewhere. Uh, and uh, so please just get in touch and uh, we'll set something up. We're more than happy to do that. Thank you, Professor Fredrik. Uh, any other question from the audience, from the participants? We still have time. I have one question, if I may ask, and you please let me know if it's the wrong forum. But uh, I, I've been so curious about how is uh, moving along with that AI center that Ericsson and and I think you, several of you were part of uh, applying for an AI center in Brazil. Yeah. Maybe I, this is Valeria again. Maybe I can comment on that briefly, Regina. Yeah, we that would be have, great. We, yes, we have. We are part in a consortium. We submitted a proposal. It's uh, being uh, under analysis, but we didn't get the answer yet. So it Do you is know supposed. When? Yeah, I think it's gonna be soon. The the last time I talked to the the consortium leader. He told me that FAPESP called him for a meeting together with the science and technology ministry representatives and so on. So in three weeks, I don't know if Professor Andrea is there. Uh, maybe I'm talking and uh, because I see one Andrea in the list of participants, I don't know if he is with us. Otherwise he could, of course, say more, <laughs> he knows better than, than myself. Uh, but we don't have the answer. But this is about this uh, intelligence at uh, this AI center uh, that we submitted to PAPESP. And uh, it is, um, uh, the focus is on smart cities, okay? For the audience that it's not aware about. I would be very curious to know more, more as soon as you know more. Yes, sounds very sure. interesting. And just to comment on that, the 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 thinking that Ericsson and Saab and Linship University was having is that we would like to connect projects at that center with projects in Sweden and make, let's say, work packages in Brazil and Sweden that connect to each other and make a joint coordinated program or project. So we have proposed such setup, but depending on this funding in Brazil. There are potential other opportunities for Ericsson to make other projects locally in Brazil that could connect to something we plan in Sweden. And I think the Swedish part is in a way underway with industrial PhDs, at least from Saab at Linköping University through the Wallenberg Autonomous System Program, potentially supported also by funding from Vinova. Thank you, Magnus, for your comments. Uh, any other question? We should have time. Maybe it's a chance for for you you guys in Brazil to introduce yourself a little bit if we have time over. Uh, some of you, if you want, as a proposition to use the time. Yeah, good, yeah. good idea. Start. Uh, yes, sure. Hello. So I'm Matheus Santos. I work with Valeria, also work with Bjorn, but I'm placed here in, in Brazil, leading the ER team in Brazil, our research team. So it's really good to to see those presentations and very, very we have a lot of opportunities here, I see. And I think I think it's good to see connections as as it was mentioned between projects, uh, not only the calls, the calls are very important. But we also have other types of projects and connect all of this. So this is really good to be here. 
Thank you. Uh, let hi, me check. Hi, uh, hi. Um, I'm Huey uh, Diana Lee. Uh, I'm in Iguazu Falls in Brazil. And my research, my my research is in computer science, some of uh, biomechanics, and mainly in health. Um, I told Alessandra that uh, maybe I was not really in the areas that this workshop was about, but I'm happy she convinced me to participate because it was very good to know about uh, AI in Sweden. Uh, also, I told her that I, am, I have personal interest uh, about the, the Scandinavian culture. I don't know very much, but I think it's uh, especially the design. So I found it was very, very good to be in this group today. Uh, I think many of us are still processing all this information because it was a lot of information and I'm sure that uh, some days from now we we will have more connections uh, from this. Thank you very much for all the talks and it was very good to know all of you. Thank you Professor Hay. Angelo, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you Alessandra. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Angelo. I am from the industry side from Susano Pope in paper and I'm responsible for to search new technologies to apply for our forest operations. So I'm focusing in forestry side and I'm very glad to to see all the developments and the opportunities we have in partnership with Sweden and I thank you once again Alessandra for inviting me and as, uh, as said there are too many opportunities, a lot of research doing uh, for, for industry uh, per se field. We need to see some things being applied in a practical and so in some applications. We, we, we know that there is some path to, to achieve that and some uh, to, 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 to reach this application in, in real life. We, we know there is some challenges in rural areas, as I mentioned in the chat, in, in forestry operations, maybe it's simplified it compared to the industry, but we are open for, for partnerships. We have been discussing with Magnus and Alessandra to, to understand some opportunities, and we are open for discussions, and I very thank you for, for the invitation, and congrats for all presentations. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Angelo. Please, Professor Elena. Oh, hi. Um, sorry, uh, first of all, sorry that I missed some, I think like five minutes or so, because it seems that my TIMS account is authenticated by the university and they they seem to have some problem with the data center in that time. And OK, I, I missed, but I, I think I didn't miss more than five minutes. Thank you so much for organizing this. It was really, really nice. Especially for me, it was really interesting because I heard a lot of things that I do, like agent-based simulation and collision uh, formation, uh, collision generation structure. It's uh, something I have done in the past, and I do a lot of reinforcement learning, especially right now I'm doing multi-objective multi reinforcement learning. So I'm really looking forward to some future collaborations, if it's possible. And thank you so much for organizing this. Thanks. Thank you. It sounds really great that we have more or less overlapping interests. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that's overlap. a great opportunity. Great. Yeah. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do we have Professor André Ponce de Leon on board? Because I can see André as a guest. Yes or no? I think that no. Yeah. Uh, someone else like to make your own introduction? We have time. We still have time. It's an opportunity for us to see the face, to listen you to say some words. Don't be shy. 
Hi, uh, thank you for organizing this workshop. My name is Fernando von Zuben yeah. from U University of Campinas. Uh, uh, we have here uh, several colleagues working with artificial intelligence. Uh, I am particularly interested in multitask learning, uh, transfer learning, evolving systems, uh, and I, I have seen uh, a lot of intersection with some presentations. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Professor Fernando. It was a pleasure to, to have you with us. Someone else? Okay. Professor Alini, why not? <laughs> Hello, Alessandra. Can I talk something? Yes. Who is talking? Flavio. Hi. Hi, Flavio. Yes, of course. Flavio Lang from CNPq. CNPq, please, Flavio. Hello. Good morning and good afternoon for our Swedish friends. And thank you very much. It was a pleasure to, to see all the presentations and to see how many opportunities we have for applied research and connections and well, we have a lot of challenges that can be faced by artificial intelligence and by the expertise of the Swedish companies and research institutes. And uh, I see that we could gather a lot of qualified Brazilian researchers to take part of it. So I, I believe we can we can make very good connection with bridges for this moment, for keeping in contact and trying to get closer to cooperate in this. So that's that's the objective of this. We are working together with CSB in some activities, as it was mentioned before the call for the, the week in Sweden, and other opportunities for postdoc and sandwich scholarships. We also were working in other opportunities with other uh, collaborators, institutions in Sweden. We have a very big program of Brazilian and Sweden collaboration that involves other Brazilian and Swedish institutions and funding agencies. So if you need any problem, any information from NPQ and from my side, I'm open for any contact from your from the Brazilian or from the Swedish partners and participants here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flavio. Someone else? No? Uh, uh, Regina, I have a question for you. Regina? Yes. Yes, yes I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I think that is good if you can explain mainly for the Brazilians. What are you doing as a leader of the working group in funny agents? Okay, because it's a wonderful initiative. Okay, can you explain for us? Because one of our ambition is to create a community that they can apply for projects, Brazil, Sweden, and it's a very important activity that you are the leader in the Swedish side. Can you can you share with us some information? Yes. Uh, I was going to say something, making fun of ourselves because we're all bureaucrats in that group, but very good bureaucrats and very uh, agile and very uh, eager to help and support. <laughs> no. Well, uh, well I, I'm Vinova is the chair of the work group for funding agencies. It was created um, in 2019. Uh, and, and the whole purpose of the group is, of course, to, to have a, a, a all the, the the research funding agencies in Brazil and, and Sweden uh, in one group and to have regular meetings, have an, a common action plan and, you know, work a little bit more strategic and focused together. Uh, and, and I mean, we have meetings, it's like seven or eight times a year. It's a little bit crazy, but at the same time, it's been great because now we know each other and, and we uh, have an action plan where we decide a little bit based on, uh, because like I said in the beginning, uh, we have five priority areas. And, and when it comes to aer uh, aeronautics, there is one action plan. When it comes to the other four areas, there are four other action plans. And uh, since we have these action plans that are decided uh, jointly between uh, Swedish point of contacts and Brazilian point of contacts, we also want to work, you know, 
strategically in, in the projects that we try to fund. So it is very important, and it was very important to hear also that this AI center is focusing on smart uh, cities, because that is one of the prioritized areas. Um, so uh, in this group, uh, we our action plans tries to synchronize with, uh, you know, what's going on in, and what is mentioned in the the action plans uh, under the subgroups. So now, for example, we have a call opening with Embrapi and Senai that opens the second of April and closes the 3rd of November this year. And, uh, well, the prioritized areas are these the four that I mentioned before. And also, so and, and of course, then you can say that smart cities is super, so broad. Bioeconomy is very broad. Health is very broad. But we have tried, thanks to the subgroups, to narrow it down. So I will put uh, another link in the chat here for that call. There you can see a little bit, okay, what are we focus, uh, focusing on? Um, but uh, I mean, uh, this, um, uh, the AI uh, bilateral discussions that, that you are, have started and that I know have, have been going, going on for a while is something that we also have discussed in this group because we're looking, you know, trying to see because Embrapi has also created a, a federal and a national AI network and has that uh, in their, you know, in their agenda. Uh, so that's I've been talking to them a little bit about that, and and we have raised this in the work group for funding agencies too. What can be, what can we do when it comes to AI? And we all agree on that AI is, you know, a part of the the pinpointed areas, of course. Um, so we'll see what happens. I mean, right now in the call that's coming, it's really, uh, I mean, okay, the, the mentioning as dig digitalization and that can be also so broad, but uh, coming within smart cities, within health specifically, uh, this is raised uh, very clearly. So, um, yeah, I don't know what else I could say, but it is... Uh, I, I think we're working in a in, in in a you know in a in a new way when it comes to funding agencies in in, in, in different in the in the bilateral collaborations. It's quite cool actually. Uh, so this is uh, yeah we're discussing AI there too and see so this is going to be very interesting to see what this can lead to. And um, yeah, I I, I I don't know if I can say this is diplomatically correct, but I, I hope you get the AI center. That would be great for all of us. <laughs> that would be very interesting to see how yeah. we can collaborate in, yeah. regarding that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, as soon as we have the call open, we will share with all of you the link of the call, CSB in Brazil or for the Swedes, we can talk and discuss about. Uh, I can share it here. Yes. Okay. Uh, one of my role in this uh, collaboration with Innova is to support the building of some consortiums, Brazil, Sweden, okay? And we will work hard on this, okay? It's my role, okay? Any other questions or interaction with the between the participants? No. Nope. Um, Alessandra, just a yeah. quick comment. Uh, some well mentioned, but... Uh, uh, just uh, em emphasizing, repeating that we do have here in Brazil at Ericsson a research team, so focused on networks, but also in, in AI. So please feel free to also contact us and to exchange some ideas about what have been discussed here. So you are more than everybody, it's more than welcome to contact us as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Valeria. Okay, after that, uh, we finish the workshop. We will we'll send to all of the participants the presentation with Samuel contact. Okay, uh, and if someone else needs any contact, please feel free to send a message to me, Alessandra, or to the CSB contact, and we will connect you to the research edits on Saab or Lean Shopping. Okay, is our role. Okay, I think that now it's time for the summary of the workshop, okay? Uh, I think that was wonderful, the first workshop. We'll have two more, okay? Hope to have all of you on board of the second and third edition of the workshop. And hope with all of these activities, we are able to create some connections 
and a collaboration as I can say bottom up, okay? And as Professor uh, Huey said, several new informations for everybody here, okay? Mainly for the AI Brazilian researchers that we invited, okay? I think that they need time to think about and feel free to ask me any kind of uh, connection that you need. I can introduce you to to these researchers or to another ones that I know in Sweden or in Brazil. Okay, as I said, uh, we CISB is the facilitator of this. Okay, and as I said in the agenda, hope to see all of you in the next workshop on April 6, when we will discuss more in details the Cacao project. Okay. It will be a pleasure to have all of you on board, okay? So, uh, thank you very much for the to be part of the workshop. It was a pleasure to organize this in partnership with CNPQ, Saab, Lean Shopping and Ed Edison. Okay, thank you very much. And now I can say that we, the workshop is finished. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye Take bye. care. It's important. Bye. Take yeah, care, bye. everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Thank you.